Have you ever been told that speaking in tongues is not for today? Maybe you've heard people speak in tongues and it seemed weird. You thought to yourself, this is too strange to be God. Or maybe you believe that people can still speak in tongues today, but that it's not for everybody. everybody. Whether you're skeptical or intrigued, whether you speak in tongues or don't, my new book, Nine Lies People Believe About Speaking in Tongues, is the book for you. Get your copy wherever Christian books are sold and head over to cbremner.com and click on the first link on the homepage for more information about how you can spread the word. Enjoy the show. Dropping some knowledge. And a little love. And a little love. This this is the Fire on Your Head podcast with your host, Steve Bremner. Steve Bremner. Steve Bremner, missionary to Peru and blogger at stevebremner.com. The podcast where we tackle gray areas your pastor doesn't talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Bremner. Greetings. This is Fire on Your Head. My name is Steve Bremner. I like to throw in some humor. I like to throw in some serious. And we got a little bit of both today with our guest, Carlos Rodriguez, or Carlos A. Rodriguez. So you don't go to Google and type in Carlos Rodriguez and find like a dozen other people. And it was a very interesting interview. I'll tell you this. I'm going to try to keep it short today. And uh, I don't I don't plan on doing an outro uh, like the last few episodes have had. Um, Carlos has a blog called Happy Sonship, right? And, and in this interview, he shares a little bit about where that came from. And I, I don't know, it's been under my radar for at least a year, maybe, maybe about a year. I've been following it. I've been listening to it. Or sorry, I've been following it and, um, auto tweeting the latest posts, um, with, with something I have that does that. And, uh, about s- six months ago or so, uh, we had a leadership meeting where we were talking about Carlos Rodriguez was going to be in Peru, and uh, I guess he had he he had been two years earlier, and um, or or he tells us in the interview like multiple times he's been in Peru. But about two years ago, we had a, had a meeting where this team from Catch the Fire, formerly known as like the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, but Catch the Fire, one of their churches in Raleigh, North Carolina, they were in Peru. Somehow got in touch with Mark and Anna Burgess. And uh, we had them all come over and instead of having a leadership meeting, this team, you know, ministered to us, prophesied over us. And Carlos, being um, the leader on that team, uh, wasn't able to make it that day. And he shares the kind of humorous reason why that worked out that way. And, um, and you know, it was great. We had a great time. So like six months ago or maybe more, we're having a leadership meeting and uh, Mark tells me, um, Carlos is coming again. And I'm not even putting two and two together that Carlos the you know the leader at or the the pastor at Catch the Fire is the same Carlos Rodriguez of Happy Sonship. Like it took me a while to put those two things together, but when when Mark said that that was going to happen, uh, I went and you know friend requested Carlos on Facebook because I'd been following his his like his his like page his author page, but sent him a friend request. We've been in touch a little bit, and uh, I asked Mark since he was coordinating this trip if he could uh, ask Carlos if he would uh, let me interview him for my podcast, because uh, prior to last week's interview with Dr. Brown, uh, somebody like Carlos would, would be a relatively high profile guest to interview. And I don't, I don't just like having people on the podcast because they're high profile or something, but I like talking to people who I would like to talk to, who I think have some interesting things to say. And I, I think that comes out in this discussion today. So another thing, uh, you may have noticed a, a difference in sound quality the last few episodes. I got a new microphone. I've been recording in a new office. And it's a bigger space than I had before. And when you live in, in Peru and there's no trees, you're in the middle of the desert, there's nothing you can build with except for concrete. <laughs> so um, it makes it challenging to have the kind of conditions that, that I need for, for the like voiceover and audiobook type of recording I'm, I'm trying to, to accomplish, uh, which I basically do in my closet. But when I, um, I sat Carlos down at my desk here in Peru, where, where I'm seated now, and, uh, and we did this recording. I thought it went great. And when I sat down to, to, to go through this and edit it again, I suddenly realized Carlos has a lovely voice. Like, doesn't he? When you listen to this, tell me you don't notice that he's got a soothing, uh, vo- like a perfect for radio voice. Whereas I'm told I've got a face for radio. But anyway, so 
the last several episodes have had like crackling noises and stuff like that. And uh, the reason for that is because I've been recording in Skype with video on so I could see the other person. Something new I've been trying and I've been taking clips of the interview, putting it online and stuff like that. And the the unfortunate thing is I haven't figured out how to not have so much um, basically like electricity, you know, that's running through my computer. I've tried it not plugged in and just on battery. I've tried, uh, um, you know, different different techniques. People like Brian Entzminger have uh, have told me. Thank you, Brian. With this one with Carlos, uh, because I didn't need to be using Skype and we were sitting here in person, I thought, man, it turned out just great. So I think I'm going to go back to just recording audio with my guests and not doing those video clips. Another practical reason is because I can publish these episodes faster. I've been publishing... I just checked my stats, and for March, I posted five interviews, five episodes. And I don't normally do that. If you look at my nine years of podcasting, that's kind of unusual. Because I've, I've you know, been on a bit of a sabbatical and, and our, our schedule is flexible, that was easy to accomplish. But things are picking up again. I'm about to be teaching every Tuesday and Thursday night again. I got some freelance work picking up. I got an audiobook to record for the month of April. Uh, so I, I, just, I just don't know if I'm going to go back to doing that. The, the Dr. Brown videos, you know, they've gotten shared and, and a lot of hits and views on, on Facebook, but it's been a lot of work, a lot of extra work. It's not streamlined my work in any way at all to be able to publish those. So I'm not doing those anymore. I'm going to go back to audio recordings only and posting these less often again, go back to like two or th- every two or three weeks posting an episode just because um, it, the podcast has kind of consumed my time. Nobody's been complaining my family hasn't been suffering or anything like that. And I've only been able to do this because of other things not happening. So that being said, you know, if, if the, these have been coming out faster than you're used to and you haven't gone and listened to them yet, go check out some of the last interviews we've been doing. You know, Dr. Brown talking about writing. We had Larry Sparks talking about revival and discipleship. Amber Picotta, uh, David Edwards and I did another one. And uh, that Matthew Robert Payne one, oh, that's still... I don't know. I wouldn't say it's going viral, but uh, definitely still continuing to get me a lot of hits and feedback. So if you're new to the podcast, I'm sure you'll enjoy us. Today's podcast is a taste of what we're like. And enjoy my interview with Carlos A. Rodriguez. So, Carlos, welcome to my concrete office. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Steve. I love being here. Um, so, um, you've been here the last few days uh, because of Mark and Anna Burgess. Yeah. Through your, your connection with them. I, you said something to me yesterday that I, I think I want to start there. Okay, about, go for it. About going to, uh, you've been to Brownsville. You're, yeah. You're, 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 you're pastor, oh. a pastor or you're the pastor of I'm one them. of the pastors. So yeah. you're one of the pastors. It's called Catch the Fire. Catch the Fire in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. I didn't want to say it wrong. I yeah, you got it. The fire. And, uh, but it caught my attention when you said uh, you've also been to Brownsville oh, in the yeah. 90s. So where do you want to start? Where do you want to go back? Okay. So whew, really long story short, got saved when I was 13, Billy Graham Crusade in Puerto Rico. Um, and then started going to a church, charismatic church. They were, you know, okay with the things with the spirit, but Brownsville and Toronto, you know, 94 and 95, that was a bit pushing it for a lot of people. Um, But we went, the youth group really was hungry. So we packed our bags and planned a trip where we did like a week missions um, with some migrant workers in Tampa and like a bit of central Florida. And then we tagged like a weekend going to Brownsville. So we did, this was 90, late 97. We did the 13 hour wait outside. We got there at 6 a.m. for the 7 p.m. service. We were literally the first one. There's about 20 young people, you know, between the ages of 15 and 20, 20 something with our past, with our youth pastors. And we went to Brownsville and we spent, we did that for two nights straight. And, you know, we got saved 14 times <laughs> during that time. It was just such a beautiful, incredible atmosphere of evangelism and winning souls and it was amazing. So yeah, we were there. So then the year after there was a youth conference um, and we decided to go plan to go to the summer youth conference. So the same group with added young people, 
went to the youth conference um, up in Brownsville and just had the most rocking time. It was just crazy. I remember being in the bus. Everybody's just full of the Holy Spirit. We're prophesying over everybody on the gas stations. It was just, it was amazing. So, it really was. So did you go to Toronto first or No, or actually, I was, Brownsville was my first. So I don't come from a Christian background, really. Um, you know, Latino, Catholic, went to Mass a few times. My mom got saved before me. Then I got saved to Billy Graham. We started going to church together. So I started to... You know, the word revival itself was unheard of. Like, I didn't even know what it means. And I remember we actually were driving past a church in Puerto Rico that was called something revival, like House of Revival. And I remember asking my mom, Mom, what's, what's a revival mean? Avivamiento in Spanish. ¿Qué significa avivamiento? What does revival mean? And she's like, oh, revival is, you know, when God is moving so much that people can fly. And I still believe that's the perfect, I still believe that is the definition of revival. Right. A place where actually the supernatural is so available. Anything can happen. People can fly. Right. So that's what went to Brownsville because it said the word revival. And I was like, well, I want to see that. And it really was just an epic thing. I loved the leaders there, loved what God was doing. Um, but because of Brownsville, then I heard of this other place in Toronto having revival, quote unquote. So then ended up. When going, you, you say with your fingers, quote unquote, like, yeah, did you, were you disappointed and discovered it wasn't or no, it was or just, you just heard it, this? It, I guess. The word revival is such a loaded question, a loaded word. Um, anybody can interpret it differently. And there's, you know, it's not like we can go to the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says about the word revival. Um, it's more of a... Or, or Trinity. <laughs> or Trinity or rapture. There's a few. Um, <coughs> or Carlos. Um, I'm not in the Bible. <laughs> right. And I'm still valid, I think. Um, but anyways, yeah, so... <laughs> The word revival is so loaded and it means so many different things to so many different people. Um, and I, 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 I don't really care. I just, we're, we're, what is God doing? Right. And I think what, what was beautiful about Brownsville and Toronto was it demanded you to be hungry and demanded you to be humble. Because you could say, and I thought these thoughts myself, oh, God can do it in Puerto Rico. God can do it in my room. Why do I have to go there? Mm -hmm. I think the going express, I'll go wherever. Right. I'll do whatever for it, you know, Right for revival. You know, I never heard of what was going on in Toronto oh, until really? I went to Brownsville. Oh, really? And because I'm from Peterborough, which is like you, you've heard of. <laughs> Two um, hours away. Yeah. I So it's like, how could I not know about yeah. this? But there's a lot of things I didn't know until going to Brownsville. Sure. Or going, going to fire, really, in Pensacola. Sure. And I would have people ask me all the time. Mm -hmm. So then, like, the next time I was in Canada, I, I visited and they were doing... um some kind of finances conference or something with yeah, yeah. Clive Pick. Okay, yes. heard of him. Yeah. And uh, and so I've been a few times over the years and, and Lily and I went the last not the last time, but the time before that that we went to Canada. And great stuff. Yeah. But it's like how I in hindsight it's really funny that I never knew about yes, this it until is. until I, I go all the way down to Florida and people And there's ask this me. Puerto Rican yeah, flying from <laughs> Puerto Rico because he wanted to be there. Yeah, I, I it was the time when the internet was like you know, so it, it Well I would stream uh, before going to fire, I would stream Brownsville Friday yes, night re yeah. revival service. It looked terrible, but it was something. But I w in in my case, I would just do audio. Yes, that's because right? that's yeah. kind of the best they had. It was yeah. actually the radio station there that was was playing it, and you could stream that radio station online. I don't know who I found that out yeah, from yeah, or whatever. Yeah, that's cool, but that's it's funny cool. because now you could just watch the video or whatever. I know, high def. <laughs> but um, I, I think you know, talking of going back to that thing about revival. If you looked at how it looked in Brownsville and how it looked in Toronto, it was like two completely different things. The Holy Spirit's moving. People's lives are being changed. Souls are coming to Jesus. There's salvations. There's healings. You know, there's supernatural stuff happening, but it looked really different. How people dress looked different. How they worship looked different. Even the invitations at the end looked different. Leadership looked different. Um, but they were both God. There's no doubt about it. God was moving. And I think what it did was create not create but show a new show a different standard of what church could be what could happen so they were both different but both valid you know and i, I really love both see that one book there world's greatest revival yeah that's right i know fred and shannon and sharon Wright, great um, people i i don't yeah, <laughs> I just read awesome. the book right yeah but i found it interesting um you know going through it when i read it five years ago or something and they they, they have little to say about Pensacola, yeah, in, uh -huh. in comparison to Toronto, yeah, because they're from Toronto. Right. I mean, they and were I, there from the beginning. I assumed that the, that yeah. to be the case from reading it and the things they share in it. But I, I always thought it odd that they didn't have 
very much to say, not just a, f- a mention sure, sure. Of, of Pensacola when you sure. think of them both. Yes. Kind of, kind of I think of them because they were both part of my journey. Right. And for a lot of people, yeah, uh, we, one of my best friends in, in Raleigh right now at our church at Catch a Fire um, was a student in Pensacola in Brownsville and now is part and then went to Toronto. His mom was heavily involved in Toronto and now are, they're with us. So I like how you pronounce it like a Canadian. Toronto? Where, yeah, without, yeah. Without pronouncing the T on the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I lived there for almost four years. My best friend, best man of my wedding is a Toronto guy. So, well, do yeah. you know that was that movie Argo with Ben Affleck? That's and he's right. Tra- and he's training them to pretend they're Canadian. He's like, no, a Canadian doesn't pronounce the T. <laughs> no way, Toronto. <laughs> and I was the only one in the theater laughing at that because it's yeah. like, it's, it's true. Yeah. It's so true. Well, that's neat uh, to meet someone. Uh, so you're you're originally from Puerto Rico. Yeah. Was, so so um, you went to Toronto first for as far as living goes before making your way to to Raleigh. Yeah. So again, long story short, born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, went to the School of Ministry in Toronto, the Catch the Fire School of Ministry, which is used to be called Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, TACF. If you're um, going to expand, I think you need to remove the Toronto from the, the name, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, it's just too much. <laughs> Toronto it's Airport too, Christian Fellowship I know, Rally. I know, yeah, it too work. much, too much. Anyway, so it's all now called Catch the Fire. Even tr- the church in Toronto is Catch the Fire Toronto because we've grown to a church planting movement. Catch the Fire Raleigh, Catch the Fire London, Catch the Fire Sydney, Catch the Fire Medellin, Colombia. We're, we're kind of moving everywhere now, which is great. Um, yeah, so I, I did, I was about to sign up to do the school in Brownsville. I was very attracted because I had gone and So there. when would this have been? This was 2000, 99, 2000, because I had gone to Brownsville. I wanted to go to the school there. Um, but then some people from Toronto came to Puerto Rico um, for one of our youth conferences, or a couple named Peter and Heather Jackson, heavily into the Father Heart. So that... I wouldn't say it was missing from Brownsville, but it was it wasn't the emphasis in Brownsville compared to in Toronto. It really was the message, the main message that was coming out. And that was the message that really it wasn't just like I shook and I fell and I felt amazing. Right. That's the message that just started to transform my insides. Um so when I heard the message from of the Father's Love from Peter and Heather in Puerto Rico, I just knew they have that that fire, they have the Holy Spirit moving, but there's this there's this sound that my heart wants to hear, that the Father loves me, that he has a plan for me. And it just it just felt right. So that's why I ended up going to the school in Toronto, 2001. Um, did the school, <clears throat> which is a five-month program, School of Ministry, SOM. And then I was asked to stay kind of like a pastor, a small group leader to students that were coming for the next two schools. And then I was asked to stay with John and Carol Arnott, who were the lead pastors in T, um, TACF, um, now Catch the Fire Toronto. So yeah, I, I did an internship with them, traveled the world with them. It was amazing. Um, met my wife in Toronto at the School of Ministry there. And she's American or Canadian? No, she's English. Okay, neither. Um, <laughs> yeah, she is from Sheffield, England, um, like Mark. Um, yeah, so we got married in Puerto Rico, and then pastors, we were pastors in Puerto Rico at a church. Love the Holy Spirit. Um, and now we're in Raleigh. We were part of the church planting team in 2008. I started at Catch the Fire Raleigh. Is it? Yeah, I, I was. So <clears throat> when you're church planting, everybody's one of something. So <clears throat> I we moved to Raleigh. I was officially youth pastor. Um, a year later, I was the worship pastor. Um, a year later, I was the lead pastor. So I was leading the campus. Um, and then I was 30, 29, leading this awesome church, growing. How, how old are you? I'm 34 right now. Okay, same age. Gotcha. Oh, cool. Very cool. July 30th, 81. Really? July 27th? No, three days. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I, I, so I'm older than <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, you are older than me. Three days older. I, but I won't hold that against you. Pretend, that's fine. That's fine. Matters or... that's, sir. Excuse no, it, me, no, sir. But the, the, only reason, the only reason that matters to me or I mentioned it is because of how like how um, similarities or parallels. In it, life, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, um, like I went to fire I, I when this, this there was the split, right? And the, sure. the fire school of ministry was formed. Sure. So I went there in uh, the fall of 2001. Okay. When uh, it's all to Toronto in spring yeah. 2001. Yeah. So, so it's like, I'm just, I'm just tracking That's with awesome, like these yeah. different parallels yeah. in our lives yeah. so far from very different worlds. It's pretty cool. <laughs> right. Um, or you could look time. at it. Like we both went to school in another country. From, That's right. We know, were. Yeah. Completely. So. Uh, God likes to do that. Gets us out of our comfort zones. So yeah, I've been in Raleigh since 2007. Again, pa- I'm pastor of many different things, but 
I became the lead pastor with my wife. Uh, we had little guys, you know, we, we have a five-year-old now and a three and a half year old. And if I'm really honest, I thought like from going to school of ministry, it was building up to finally being the lead pastor of a church. You know, that was the pinnacle, the epicness, you know, that's all I was working towards all my prophetic words all my times of prayer. Once I became a lead pastor, I just, you know, it was a lot of pressure. It was hard work. Um, and I personally, Carlos Alberto Rodriguez Sostre couldn't handle it. I, 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 I got angry. I got frustrated. I started arguing a lot with my wife and ministry was doing really well, but family wasn't doing that great. So almost three years later, we just went to our leaders and mostly my wife um, <laughs> went to our leaders and, and we just, you know, we just, we have so many issues. We, things are not doing well. And we, we made a choice to choose our family over ministry, which was really hard because ministry was doing well. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we made that choice and it's been the greatest choice. So we stayed part of the team. The church was really supportive. We started going to marriage counseling and we started to live out all the stuff that we were preaching to other people. Now it was our turn um, to surrender our hearts and just, you know, walk that it's, journey. And, and that's very interesting to me because I want to ask you about happy sonship. Yeah, please. That's, that's definitely the main thing I knew somewhere in this conversation will come up. Okay, good. When when you tell me about going to Brownsville, yeah, um, you know the the whole God is in a good mood or he's happy mm -hmm. that that's not strong. Or mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I have friends who sure. who think I've gone off my rocker or I, yeah, I yeah. emphasize hyper grace too much or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and you know, Doctor Brown, the uh, I just had him off, yeah. <laughs> on my dinky little podcast. Yeah, I got Doctor Brown the book against it, and um, <laughs> and and so a like, really good book actually. So so I I'm used to like the the, the Brownsville sure. hardcore repentance flavor, sure, and I view like the Catch the Fire more like that that you know God loves you, He yeah. likes you, He thinks you're cool kind of yeah. message, yeah. And I don't think the two things are like um, they're not competing mutually. Sure. Yeah, they're not mutually exclusive, they're right? Not, no. So it so it's funny to me when I've got some friends or, or, you know, people in, in that circle that they, they have a reaction against. Yeah. But what, what I want to ask you about, or I, you know, I don't know if maybe there's, there's some kind of light that went off or whatever, yeah. but um, your, your blog is one of the few that I have automatically like on Twitter that it automatically posts. The oh, new posts. thanks, man. Yeah. yeah I thank you. That's sweet of me. <laughs> right. That's and, awesome. And even before reading every single post, like yeah, it's just yeah. automatically <laughs> set to do that. Oh, come on. Because, you know, I, cool. I, I've read a lot, but it's not like, yeah. Sometimes I see in my own Twitter feed, oh, Carlos has a new post, right? <laughs> I've just promoted this crazy stuff he said. <laughs> right. And I, I should check it out. But yeah. <laughs> but no, but what I'm saying, Thanks, what I, what, where I'm going with this is that I hear of someone like Shia LaBeouf yeah, supposedly yeah, yeah. getting saved and I have this sure. reaction like, ah, oh, it's fake. Yeah. And then, oh, Carlos has this blog coming out about like, yeah. no, let's look at it from God's perspective. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Bruce Jenner, you yeah, know, yeah, your yeah, post yeah. about Bruce Jenner that yeah, I think yeah. is trending on your site today yeah. or always. Yeah. Or um, whoever it is, whatever celebrity that like the church, we can have this judgmental kind of reaction. Sure. Going, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep my eye on this mm -hmm. one first. Mm -hmm. And then and then you come along and have a mm -hmm. post that's like, yeah, um, well, we're all like filthy pigs in the mud. Yeah. And God picks us up and wipes <laughs> us off, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't know where to start exactly with that, but, yeah. but I, I, I expected this to come up. Cool. So so how did you, I don't know, like where did this, this kind of light go off for mm. you of, of God being like this? Yeah, so really being in Toronto, I really discovered the Father's love. Um, and I really discovered my value in him. And he loves me. He's called me. He has a plan for me. I have this beautiful inheritance that's available. Um, I think ministry then revealed to me, yes, he really loves you. And yes, you are amazing, but you're also really flawed. And you're also in process and you'll never end up being, you know, that process will never end. It's just well, you know, once we're in heaven and, you know, but that's part of part of my walk. So in a way, went to Brownsville, discovered really repentance and really surrender, which was beautiful. Then went to Toronto, discovered how much he loves me, even if I don't repent, you know, which inspired me to repent even more. Right. And then once I really know his love and start moving into my inheritance, into my sonship. But then I, I, I would say personally, I started to forget the fact that I'm fragile. And the message of the father's love in a weird way deceived me to believe everything was okay and I could get away with anything and I'll be forgiven and da, 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 da. And in a way that's true, I will always be forgiven, but I can't get away with everything. Well, that, it's interesting you say that because I hear people say all the time, if there's too much emphasis mm -hmm. on grace, mm -hmm. it leads to like this type of living. Yeah. So, so how, did, how did that work with so you? So I think it does, but I think it's good. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for making that face. Um, it's a problem Paul had. He had to address in Romans 6. This is not a new problem. Right. He over preached grace and he always had to, you know, because there's grace doesn't mean we can sin. Right. You know, um, but that's the thing. In a weird way, I think when you really get the message of grace down, it will, because of human nature, lead you more to permission um, to, you know, overextending it, which then becomes, which then in a way you're faced with the reality, wait a minute, I really am broken. I really need Jesus. I really need help. I really need community. I really need the process. I really justified, but I really need sanctification. Right. In, a, in a way, it just, it just the journey demands that. So again, this is just me learning because I'm, I'm an, I will always be learning, but that's what happened to me. Um, so the last three years I've been in a journey of rediscovering, I'm just broken, I'm hurting, I'm lonely. I, you know, I need Jesus just as much as the people I preach Jesus to. I need the gospel just as much as the people I think they need the gospel. I need it just as much. I need it today as much as I needed it 13 years, you know, when I was 13 years old and got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. So that's, that's kind of that tension of I'm loved and I'm accepted. There's absolute grace for me. And at the same time, I'm broken, I'm needy. So I do need that grace all the time. Well, it's interesting that you say that. Do you, do you think that, people benefit or people need to go down a similar journey of, of grace and, and, and experiencing like, uh, if you want to call it like greasy grace yeah, in order to get that appreciation like you did, or do you think it's like a, a, a personal journey? Yeah, I, think it's, on, I think it's a personal journey. I hope it's not the same journey for everybody because <laughs> it was really hard. Um, I have to say, it seems like it's, it's part of most people's journey you get to a point where, you know, you're really experiencing what God has for you and all these prophetic words are coming and things are moving along in a good way. And then all of a sudden you're faced with the fact that you're still sinful and still have issues and still struggle with lust and still struggle with anger or whatever it is. And it just brings us back. I think, you know, it's, it's about dependency. It's about trusting God and knowing that you're, you need help. So that's part of that. I don't know. It's, it's been a hard journey, but it's been a worthwhile journey. Right. Yeah. So what, how did you come up with the idea to call your blog Happy Sonship? Okay, so I love preaching on sonship. It's the message that I carry. One of the things about the message of the Father's love has been that we've contained it a bit too much to church. Um, and I've seen the best results of evangelism, of winning souls, by using the message of the Father's love that we mostly preach in church. I preach it in prisons, maximum security prisons, um, high schools, and it seems to work best there. The world is really looking for a good daddy. Everybody's mm. desperate for the kind of father we're preaching. But I think we're just preaching him too much in church. He really, wow. I mean, you know, the Luke 15 story belongs in every school, in every prison, in every place of government in the world. Everybody's looking for that dad. So I love the message of sonship. I preach it. I live it as much as I can. Um, I, I, I've written a book about it. And anyway, so I wanted to buy the, I wanted to buy the domain sonship.com. You it know how taken. it is. Somebody owns it. It's 20 grand. I'm like, whatever. And it was the time, it was the summer when I was the least happy in my life because I had just stepped down from being a lead pastor. I was going through this process of really being faced with all my weakness and all my, I'm going to this counselor who's constantly be telling me, you need to work with this. You need to deal with that. You know, I want to make sure everybody else is the problem, but no, actually I'm the problem. Um, so I was the least happy that summer. And then my kids were in love with this happy song from Pharrell. Happy, right. and, uh, in, 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 yeah. happiness is the truth. So one day I just like put them together, happy sonship. <laughs> Bought the domain, started the blog, and it's been a ridiculous success. Praise Jesus. It's been so, great. so for people who might be listening and aren't tracking exactly with yeah. that that aspect of your message with uh, identity and sonship. Yeah. Uh, can you can you explain a little bit about like okay, so somebody logs on to happysonship.com. Yeah. What is the it's like they, they call it your niche, right? So what is your niche or what is the, the particular thing that like people can expect on any given article they click on? Yeah. It'll typically be about So so the so my intention with it, what I try to do with it is to have a grace perspective on anything. We're talking politics, Donald Trump, let's have a grace perspective whether you're voting for him or not, let's have a grace perspective. We're talking Bruce Jenner came out. He wants to be Caitlyn Jenner. Let's have a grace perspective towards it. Um, I'm not giving answers. If I'm honest, I'm giving a perspective that's based on grace. Um, it, it doesn't have, you know, the, I'm not a theologian. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. 
Um, but I, I, I just try to have a grace perspective on whatever's going on. So I write, I write on whatever's trending on culture. I write on parenting, on relationships, on leadership. A lot of, I try my best to be as radically honest as I can, share part of my journey. Um, and I think people really enjoy that. People really enjoy honesty. The fact that I don't know everything, the fact that I've been broken and I don't know, it just, it just taps into people's desire for something that's not superficial, but actually real. So, so what I'm following it for and getting out of it is, is like, I don't know that like if you and I sat down mm-hmm. about, and we talked about different things, we, we would like see eye to eye or not. Sure, I sure. don't, I don't know what would happen if we did, Yeah, but yeah. I, I feel like sometimes it wouldn't. But what I like about the perspective you bring yeah. is it's kind of like, oh yeah, I'm forgetting about the, that grace aspect yes, in this situation. Yes. I'm, I'm glad. Because I, just, I am all the time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because so, that's the truth. <laughs> so it's like, so I was like, I'm glad I, that Carlos wrote that, that article about it. Yeah. Or like Justin Bieber or whoever, yeah, yeah. whoever whatever the celebrity is that. Like, I, I feel proud about the Justin Bieber journey because I'm getting proven right on that one at least. <laughs> right. Because I wrote when, you know, he started to, there's reports of him getting baptized, there's reports of him starting going to church and everybody's like, blah, 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 blah. Right. And so, in my heart would be like, um, I want that to be true. I want to believe he's sure. do, he's doing good, but, but he's he's out there in that that system. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. it's like my knee jerk reaction is, oh, you know, he peed in a mop bucket or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure, for real Christ like whatever. But mm-hmm. then then um, something shows up in my Twitter feed or whatever, and it's like, ah, yeah, Carlos has this, <laughs> this great perspective to make me realize yeah. just how gracious the Father is to me is, in in yeah. my you know public. Yeah, mop peeing. Yeah, that that people are watching me do or yeah, whatever. Exactly. So so to speak, kind yeah, of so you know. to speak. <laughs> yeah, and 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 to be honest with you, it's because I think both ways. If I'm if I'm truthful, I see something. I'm like I'm first cynical, critical, judgmental. I think it's part of human nature. Some are better than others at doing it, um, but some hide it better than others. Right. Um, but but I I so the invitation from the Holy Spirit is always like just my perspective. You know right. what's my perspective, and I. And I try my best to then communicate that part of my journey. Again, it's what I do. I criticize, I judge, I complain, I don't believe. Then I, through the Holy Spirit, through the filter of grace, I try to present it. You know, what about this other perspective? Right. So what about, um, how how did you wind up here? In, in for, How do you know Mark? And how, did, okay. how, did, how have you, you know, you, you were talking a little bit on the walk over here. Yeah. Uh, this so, stuff I'm curious about. Yeah. So I, so right now I am leading what is called Catch a Fire Land America. Again, everything's fire or something. So we have Catch a Fire Toronto, Catch a Fire Raleigh, Catch a Fire London. This different. podcast is fire on your head. Well, there you go. I went we're to family. fire school of ministry. <laughs> so we're family for sure. So I am, um, so I lead what's called Catch a Fire Land America. So we have churches, but we also have ministries, Catch a Fire USA, Catch a Fire England, Catch a Fire UK, excuse me. Um, so I lead, I'm starting to lead Catch a Fire Latin America. Um, we want, we're wanting to do mission projects. We believe in what God is doing in Latin America. We believe in the Latin people. We believe in, you know, um, the, the incredible heritage of God in all these nations, Colombia, Peru. We do a lot of stuff in Colombia. Um, so the connection with Mark and Anna was, I was here already in Peru doing what we call an ILSOM, an International Leader School of Ministry, which is a five-day school for pastors and leaders to be completely immersed in everything that we've learned from Catch a Fire the last 20 years. So I was doing that at a church um, in Barranco and through Twitter, thank you, social media, um, Mark had heard of me preaching at his church in England, in St. Tom's, Sheffield. Um, So he knew that I was here following me on Twitter. We connected and I had received a prophetic word maybe three weeks before that I was on my next trip, I was going to meet a man of peace. That was be a man that I would needed to be in contact with, that I would build with, that we would do projects together in the future. So when I met Mark, I just felt maybe this is the guy. Honestly, I'm just maybe, just a maybe. And this was that last trip. That was my last trip that I was here. So we've stayed connected through social media. We've Skyped a few times. I've told him this was just before I started to go on that journey of healing and, you know, um, getting marriage counseling and, you know, dying a million deaths. Um, so I, I kept him updated about the whole journey, but I've always felt I'm going to come um, and I'm going to, you know, see what you guys are doing and just provide whatever I can provide help, assistance, service, clean bathrooms, save some souls, whatever I can podcast so with one podcast with Steve. Members. Yeah. So <laughs> whatever I can. So that's why I'm here. It's every once in a while I force myself to do trips that are not for me or for my honorarium 
or for how good it's going to look on social media. But go to serve, go to meet people, go to do life with others. So, you know, I'm staying with Mark and Sarah at their house, playing Minecraft with their Anna, kids. Mark and Anna. Mark and Anna. What did I say? Sarah. That's because my, my best friends in Toronto, Mark and Sarah Tillman, incredible worship leaders, get their album. It's awesome. Mark and Sarah Tillman. Um, so yeah, Mark and Anna. Um, so I'm staying at their house and just loving on their kids and just, you know, being part of what they do. Right. Um, so it's been great. It really has been great. Um, I don't know if, if I, I said much of this to you yesterday, but when uh, that your team was here with you last time, yeah, uh, we had this meeting in, in the apartment I lived in at the time. You, know, right. you know where the school is, right? Yes, we, my right. wife and I lived on the third floor. And so instead of having our weekly leadership meeting, we had... Um, your team, yeah, and you were you personally weren't able to, I was to the be only there. That couldn't come, right? I, I was staying somewhere else, right? So I, I don't remember what the details were, but it, I just remember that that was a meeting where I think we had uh, chairs. We made a circle, yeah, uh, facing outward, and all of us in our team here, yeah, we, we were seated and we were taking turns getting like, um, you know, two or three people taking turns to pray for each one of us. That's I think cool. I think we did away with the chairs and had to stand up and stuff like that. Sure, sure. And I just remember being it it being a wild, mm-hmm. crazy good time mm-hmm. yeah and it's like i think of of catch the fire yeah. rally uh yeah. you know these people who came th- yeah. these are the only people i know from that place yeah. but yeah. you you in particular weren't weren't there that day yeah i know uh, i know I was, so we were part of we were doing a school we were doing awesome meetings but for some reason the place that i was staying they didn't pick me up i was dressed to come and i just stayed home you know answered some emails and and saw the photos of what was going on here but yeah so uh, I, I wanted to be here, but I just, I'm, I made my way this year. It was the right, right timing. Yeah. So um, yesterday in, in church, you were talking about John. No, I, f- I forget if it was Luke three or something. Mm-hmm. The journey um, between Luke three and Luke four. Yeah. Right. With, um, uh, the, I would love it if you repeated a bit about sure. that on, the, on this, this recording yeah, I'd love to. with regard to um, the, the open heaven. Yeah. Uh, because that type of thing has come up a few times in the last uh, on this podcast, I actually like it more. In let me see if I find it. You have a Bible? Yeah, of, any any of those. Right Make sure it's not the Spanish one. It's English. What's this guy, English ESV? standard, beautiful. I like ESV. So do I, but not that particular copy. It's kind of a cheaply made copy. Yeah, yeah. the text is kind of hard to read. But anyway, <laughs> in, in I was teaching on which is the same story in Luke three, um, but I'm going to share from specifically because you asked me about the open heavens. I love it in Mark 1, okay. um, starting in verse 9, 9, 10, and 11, because it says, baptism of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. This is Mark 1, starting in verse 9. Verse 10, and when he came out of the waters, immediately, I love that word, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And I always remember Hulk Hogan in the 80s tearing his shirt apart every single time. And I always think, I, I, I don't think anybody was sewing that shirt back together. Right. When you tear something open, it's because you're not planning to put it together. It's You're making a statement. You're done with it. We're done with it. We're done with the closed heavens. So I, I love it that Mark uses specifically that expressions immediately. Number one, it was not this long drawn out process of prayer and trying to make it happen and just like open the heavens, please. Immediately the heavens were torn open and the spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form. Luke, Luke focuses more on the fact that it was the bodily form of the dove that was the Holy Spirit. It's the same story. Um, and the voice of the father saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Um, it's a beautiful expression of the Trinity. Um, it's a beautiful, and I was sharing yesterday how Jesus did not need to get baptized. He was the only human being that did not need baptism because it was for repentance of sins, but he was baptized in you and me, in us. It was like this prophetic, this statement of the cross of his mission, you know, to be immersed in our waters of sin and brokenness and death and then come back resurrected. But I love it. Immediately the heavens were torn open. So we believe with all our hearts and we pray it, we preach it, um, and, that the heavens were never put back together. Well, they're still it, open. Not only that they were they were uh, never put back together and they're still open, but that, <laughs> but I I took away from it or I like that idea because yeah. it because it reinforces some other things I've talked about before mm-hmm. that um like they they stayed open over in this case Jesus yeah. everywhere he went yeah and um and it it's I guess the same with yeah. any, like we're we're in the kingdom we take the kingdom with us wherever we yeah. go 
and and you kind of have have sown this thread throughout the other things that you've you've talked about that yeah uh, this this message of grace being mm-hmm. uh, well received outside of the four walls of the yes, church yes uh, more so than in it and I was I think to myself of how um, I hear passages like this about like oh God rend the heavens and come yeah, down yeah, yeah. And I imagine him saying I am down yeah, yeah, yeah. I am there yeah, yeah. go you know yeah. or like like Moses with his his rod yes, they're about, they're, they're about he's like praying just yeah, move yeah. yeah just why are you crying out to me yeah. lift up the, your rod yeah. and and part the the waters yeah, yeah. and um because you know a while ago I had this guy uh, his name is Stephen Crosby mm-hmm. and I, I I have him on the podcast a lot and the last time I had him on we talked about this this kind of mentality we have in certain Mm. a lot of charismatic circles yeah of like we have to like do something to get god's presence to show up yeah as opposed yeah. to like no it's here yeah we just might feel it differently yeah. than other yeah. moments yeah and i felt like i i had these these lights going off about the the open heaven thing mm-hmm. the, the heavens are open they've not been sewn back shut and then no nope. we have to pray uh, a certain way every morning and then they they open mm. again and if we we forget to pray. They, they kind of close back up again. Mm-hmm. And it, it, like, it doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't, no. Um, it so doesn't. that was kind of riveting for me to, to listen to you talk about. Well, I, I can imagine. So the disciples, some of them could have been witnesses of this happening because some of them were disciples of John. So they would have been with John. Some of Jesus' disciples were first disciples of John. So some of them could have been here witnessing this. And some of them, then we know when, Jesus, when they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, if he's walking in their open heaven and he's saying, pray like this, our father in heaven. So uh, t- I like, I'm a visual person. So I can imagine Jesus putting his head, his head up, looking up. There's an open heaven. It's been torn open. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done because the heavens are open. So there is, so I would say, and I've, and I've had, for example, when we start singing, you know, let it rain, let it rain, open the floodgates of heaven. We start singing that song. The the guy who wants to be a theologian in me starts saying, no, that's not theologically correct because the heavens are open already. But the human grace-filled Jesus in me starts saying, it really doesn't matter how right. you're saying it. It's the, the fact that your heart is looking for that. It's, well, like you're one, hungry for one that. One minute you're singing, uh, send the fire, and then, yes, I, and then the next minute, send the rain. Won't the <laughs> rain put the fire out? You know? Just put the fire out. Yeah, so I, I think words, I think we've overemphasized the value of words, even though they're very important. Um, and obviously theology is extremely important. And, and to be trained to, to know God's word is just so valuable. But God really is looking for humility. He's looking for hunger. That's really what he's attracted to. So maybe it's not expressed perfectly um, in words, but if it's expressed right in the heart, he'll respond to it. Um, he has with me many times. My theology has been a mess. Probably Mine still too. is. <laughs> but he's responded with love and kindness and his presence. So, but, but you know, there. so Jesus, the heavens were torn open. The Holy Spirit descends on him. The voice of the Father says, this is my beloved son. And then when the disciples ask him, teach us how to pray, it's already like this. Immediately pray. Our Father in heaven, you're there. Hallowed be your name. Make that name holy. What name? The name Father, which is good and kind and loving. The Father of Luke 15. And then let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so there is so there is an element of asking, of you know taking, but it's in the consciousness that it's already available. As opposed to there's nothing available. Everything is shut. Nothing's going to happen. So we're asking because we're victims and we're suffering. Um, So I think it's a little bit of both. But for sure, the heavens were torn open. It's more available than we think. Jesus preached the kingdom of God is at hand. If you think about your hand, it's right there. It's attached to you. So if the kingdom of God is at hand, as far as you extend your hand. It's close. It's close. It's It's near. It's in reach. It's within reach. Exactly. So... You know, if I, I believe there's a whole new generation of believers, of young Christians, um, like any generation, have their issues and have their struggles, but they're being raised with more of this. Yeah, it's available. Yes, it's here. Yes, it's now. Yes, it's ours. And I'm excited for the potential of that to be manifested in salvations and revival and souls and in business and reformation, which is really what we need. Right. You know, um, Jack Frost. Yeah, of course. I was just with his family a few weeks ago. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember Mark and Anna gave me a copy of his book from Spiritual Slavery, to Spiritual Son- or yes. whatever the exact title is, Slavery to Sonship. Right? Yeah, it's great. And uh, and, I, and it made this huge impact on Phenomenal me. Phenomenal book. The, the idea that both sons could be 
uh, in the parable, the, the prodigal yeah, 15, son, yeah. yeah, that the one son could be, uh, well, look, how come you've never done anything for me? I've been with you all these years. Your older brother, yeah. You know? know, and the other one is, is like, oh, I mean, I'm not even fit to be, mm-hmm. you know, a servant mm-hmm. to my dad's house, but maybe he'll take me in. Mm-hmm. And that the one who had the attitude of, of, okay, uh, I, I'm going to give it a shot. Mm-hmm. The father blesses him. Yeah. But we forget the part of the story where when the son comes, the the other brother who didn't leave comes mm-hmm. and says, um, but all these years, you know, I've, I've served, served you. you, yeah, served, you even, I've served I you. I've served you. I know that. And you've never done anything like this for me. And he yeah. says, haven't you, don't you know? You've been with me all this time and all you didn't I know that all yours. I have is yours? All I have is yours. And it's like, that's been in the Bible all this time and I never saw that before. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Which the father proved that all he had was the sons when he gave the inheritance to the younger brother. Right. He had already proven the fact that all I have is yours. Right. And he gave him the inheritance back, gave him the ring, which, you know, was a sign of the inheritance returning. No doubt right. about it. So I saw on Facebook, <laughs> yeah. or maybe it was like an email, I saw that his... His other book, Experiencing the Father's Embrace, yes, phenomenal. Was, was available. And I'm reading it now. I'm like, oh, good. Uh, so it was free. And I, yeah. I, I made one of my bit.ly links. Very of, cool. Uh, with, you know, like I just wanted to see. Yes, it what, was available a couple of weeks ago. They, yeah. they put it out. Yeah. So uh, what I did was I made a bit.ly link and I posted it on Facebook. And I've never shared something that got as many reshares and Come clicks on. as Come that on. book. And so I say that to say... Um, like I got like 2000, like pe- basically like I could track 2000 people getting that book or That's at least clicking awesome. on the link and going to it. Right. Awesome. And I say that to say like there, you know, there's something to be said when a book is free as opposed to, sure. you know, you pay for it, but people want it. That yeah, they book. want it. They see a book about experiencing the father's yes, embrace. They, they sure. go for it. For sure. And, and so I'm just saying that to track with you about this, this message with, uh, you know, and I can't track who the people are that buy this book. If they're sure. in the church or out of the sure. church, but Free, sure, I'll I'll take it. Yeah, Father's Embrace, yeah, I'll get on that. Yeah, and uh, and I don't know, 30, 40, you know, reshares of yeah. of the link I made. So, it's, so it, it just multiplied, right? So I didn't. That's so good to So hear. I don't I don't share it to get some kind of like you know I don't put my code or anything in it because it's sure. it's, a, it's a free book and stuff. Yeah, yeah. What's the but, point? But to be able to track like you know, I like to see what kind of influence I can have on social media and where yeah. things are spreading. And I don't think I've ever seen a book like that. People that were as so good as into as that. So, um, I forget. honestly, Steve, I was just with them a few weeks ago doing one of their schools, Trisha Frost, who's Jack's husband, um, wife and their kids, um, Sarah and Doug, who are leading now the ministry. They're the executive directors, amazing people still carrying the message even after Jack passed, um, and carrying it with the same passion, same compassion. And like I was saying, maybe 20 minutes ago, this is the message the world is looking for. They're We're all desperate for. for this father's love. We really are. Um, we're impressed by other messages, supernatural and anointing and power. Those messages are awesome, but the message we need is the message of the Father's love. I go to, we minister to the Fulani people in Niger. This is a nomadic tribe that goes between Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso. And when I go there, 90% of what I preach in the Western church doesn't apply. My stories don't really relate, you know. The, I had even a virus some, on my computer the other day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, even some of the Bible verses just don't relate as well. Um, but when I talk about the Father's love, when I share the story of Luke 15, everybody has had some brokenness with their father in one shape or form. And everybody's desperate for the kind of father Jesus came to reveal. So I'm so glad you did that. Good job. Um, <laughs> and if you haven't gotten the book, please go get it. In, um, the Father's yeah. Embraced by Jack it's, Frost. It's probably full price now, but... Yeah, oh, it's still, still a small price um, to pay for, for what's nothing. in it. Yeah. I'm about 60% of the way through it. I'm taking my time reading it because it's always at the time I read that that other book and then yeah. this one now. I, I read them relatively slowly compared to books I, I normally yeah. read. Yeah. And just because of how much they're rocking my world. That's so good. And, uh, I think oh. the chapter I was just reading was about like the mother heart of God. Yes. The father the and nurturer. the mother. Yeah, that's heart. right. And that was, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. Yeah. When your team was here the other time, you know, one one person just kept praying over me all over and over again, mother, father, yeah. God. And I'm like, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I don't say yeah. that to, to be like, no, 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 I know uh, what you mean. Because if, the, if this person hears, I don't want them to think. But I was like, no, no, no. I really couldn't concentrate. Yeah. Uh, I was like, mother, yeah, I know. God, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, and, and I was just like, I, I don't remember. <sighs> I don't remember in particular what she prayed because yeah. of how distracted I was to hear her say yeah, it. Like, yeah, I know, I know. But like, but then after reading in, in this book, the aspects of God that are like 
the the the, the nurturer. Yeah. Um, yes, you right. Know, and and shalom, um, um, El Shaddai, yes. the many-breasted one. Exactly that exactly. that kind of stuff. El Shaddai. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, know, like I weaned you. You know, yes. like these kind of things. I know. Um, it's like okay, I get. I, like I immediately remembered. I remember now where that person was coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't know that I would pray that same way, but it was more like. I wouldn't I, probably either. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and sister, if you're Especially listening, to this, we're not making fun no, of you. No, we love you. It's, yeah. yeah, but it was like amazing. okay, I could I could swallow it a little bit better now that I had somebody lay that out in this book. Yeah. You know, he had a yeah. chapter on the on father issues and a chapter mm-hmm. on mother issues. And I was like, I had a good relationship with my mother, so that's not gonna. I don't know what I'm gonna get out of this chapter. Yeah. But then I start reading, it, and I'm like, but that that idea of viewing God as like he's got these these both yeah, kind of natures of to it. Like yeah. he's, he's God, he's the source of everything. So of course he's the source of like masculine motherly, and feminine. Yeah. You know? He's the source of it. And so again, this isn't meant to specifically be a plug for the father's embraced by Jack Frost, but we'll, well make I'm you doing it. this is my plug because <laughs> I love them and believe in them and they changed my life. And so, but when I have people on the podcast, I always let them plug something, right? Cool. Do you, cool. you, but you, you've got a book, but not, you don't yeah, I have a, a book. It's called the sign for inheritance. Um, and it's, it's, I, it's so Jack Frost, Peter Jackson, Ed Pjork, um, some of these Jack Winter, some of these great teachers of the Father's Love theology um, that reached that generation really that was coming through Toronto, um, early '90s, late '90s, and even to the 2000s. And I just felt like I wanted to be part of that. Um, I just wanted to share my story of my encounter with the Father, my brokenness with my own father. Um, now how to relate to spiritual fathers, becoming a father myself to my children and even to other people. So it's a, it's, you know, it's 13 fun chapters, lots of stories, um, about the father's love and a lot of it about how it applies outside. So there's two stories specifically in chapter one and chapter 13. Chapter one is about teaching Luke 15 in a high school with the worst students. They literally gather the worst students they could find. And I taught them about Luke 15, the prodigal son, but I acted it out with them. And once I started running towards this, the worst students that they had, I started running towards them like the father ran to the prodigal son. I started hugging them and kissing them like the story says in Luke 15, 21. I mean, it was probably the greatest revival meeting I've ever been to in my life. Holy Spirit came. They started crying, repenting. It's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. I did something similar in a maximum security prison, um, which I share on chapter 13. And I started to share about them. The father loves you. And I heard God's voice say, Tell the men who have sexually abused their daughters that I forgive them. That's what I heard in my mind. And so there's that that battle. The critical me, judgmental me was like, there's no way I'm doing this. There's no way I'm saying this. The Holy Spirit kept, you know, pushing me to do it. And I eventually did. And thank God I did. And I started to share that. And all these men started to repent. And probably the second greatest revival meeting I've ever been to in a maximum security prison. Both locations, just teaching about the Father's love. Because again, that's what the world's hungry for. And that's the message that Jesus came to preach. He came to reveal the Father. Nobody comes to me. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. He is the message of the Father. He is the life of the Father, the life of a son. So I just love preaching it. The sign for inheritance, you can get it through my blog, happysonship.com. And come and join us. It's great. great. And is that the only book you have? Cause, or is that the one that has the, the fingerprint? The fingerprint, the yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the fingerprint one. It's actually, um, we're actually redoing it. Next month, it's coming out. Um, you know, the second print with some study guides and some extra stuff that I've added. I'm working on my second one, Drop the Stones, which is more um, now that we know the message of grace, how does that apply to homosexuals, people who've had abortions, people in prisons, um, you know, your family members, um, pastors who have fallen in great sin. So Drop the Stones is about how that message of John 8 applies to all these categories that we, the church, finds uncomfortable to deal with and how Jesus would approach it. Wow. So I'm working on that right uh, now. So so give give us a sneak for you. Give us a nutshell. How I mean, I know the simple answer, yeah. but so how do, how does God deal with these things? So besides the simple, obvious answer, <coughs> you know, so what I've just, I, I've really studied John eight and the story of the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Um, I, there's a few things that I've, I love about the story. It says that Jesus, it's the first thing in the morning he's in the temple. So this woman was caught in the act of adultery, meaning it just happened that night. She was caught in the act of adultery. Now caught means she would have caught her with the other person too, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, yes. (laughs) So the fact that she was caught in the act of adultery means maybe somebody walked in as she was having sex with the husband of another woman, right? 
The husband's not there. It's the woman that's being brought to the temple, right. dragged through the streets. Who knows how much clothes she's wearing? She was just caught in the act of adultery. And now she's at the feet of Jesus. And that interaction between the Pharisees and Jesus, I just absolutely love. Um, it, it's it's one of those stories that the world loves to hear. You 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 can go on Twitter and look at look at people that don't follow Jesus, and they'll talk about you know whoever's free of sin, throw your first stone. That story relates to the heart of sinners because because it's true because we're all sinners, and I think the world is not the world is not put off by our sin, the church's sin. The world is put off by our fakeness. Right. Well, do you think, uh, because you've been studying this, I've, I've, yeah. I've, I can't think of it any other way since sure. learning this, that maybe the person she was caught with, yeah. like his his way of saying, the, um, yes. you know, he was without sin for the first stone, it was a way of like challenging, well, whoever she was with, yes. go for it. Uh, you know, come, show yourself. Yes, 100%. Because, because um, I heard someone say the in the Old Testament, that you you only put somebody to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Yes. The witness would have been the guy she was sleeping with. The witness, or or like one of those two witnesses would yes. have to be the person. Yes. So it was kind of like Jesus' way of saying, "Okay, you guys want to stone her? Yeah. Well, then uh, where, where's who, the other yeah, guy? Where's the other guy? Yeah. And, and maybe was you know one of the Pharisees or something. I, I've thought, and this is very personal. Please don't preach it for <laughs> or say that I've said this. When Jesus goes to the ground and starts writing on the floor. I don't know, maybe he was writing different sins. And then he says, okay, whoever's free of sin, like, look at the list down here, guys. Um, it says right. that the old man left first, you know, right. and the young. So it's like, oh, I got four of those sins. I'm out of here. Uh, but 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 the beautiful interaction at the end, which is my main thing that I, I want to draw out in the book, is Jesus' interaction with the woman. He's left alone with this woman, it says. He's left alone. This woman was just caught in the act of adultery. We're talking about a 31, 32, 33-year-old virgin who... His main thing is to proclaim that he's free of sin so he can die for sinners. And he's left alone with a woman that's just been caught in sin. And he says to her, where are those who condemn you? Mm -hmm. Her only thing, her, her sinner's prayer, her moment of surrender was saying, no one, Lord. And he says to her, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. So there's two camps in church. The ones that focus on neither do I condemn you and the ones that focus on now go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I want to write about how we can invite people into I both. Go and sin no more, right? Which one? Go and sin no more, or is it? Right there next to Holy Fire. Oh, yeah. Go and sin no more. That's right. Brown, that's right. But not that, not that uh, if I remember that book right, that, that he only emphasized that. Sure. It was a pretty, prof you can see, it's a pretty big, profound book. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so it's almost the Brownsville and the Toronto camps coming together. Right. You know, it really is. Neither do I condemn you. I, I believe you can't, you, you don't earn the right to invite people to a life of surrender and holiness to Jesus unless you first walk that journey of no condemnation. Mm -hmm. When you walk the journey of no condemnation, and Jesus being the only one who could have condemned her, he was the only one who could have picked up a stone and slowly but surely killed her. Right, but right? didn't. But didn't. Because I, I think it would have been unfair because Jesus was going to die for her adultery. So two people in the same lifetime would have died for the same sin. Wow. Right? So Jesus is saving her from, it It would have been unfair under the law of Moses for her to be stoned because somebody was going to pay for that sin. It just wasn't going to be her. Wow. So he still fulfilled the law. Just himself. Just himself. Yeah, I got to unpack that and, and process that. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to this book. <laughs> yeah, thanks, bud. I appreciate that. Appreciate I'm looking forward to it too. <laughs> I bet you it. are. Yes, yeah. it's coming out. So, um, so as you can see, this is how long we've been talking. Okay, good. Excellent. That's what time it is. All right. So uh, anything else you're burning with that you, you'd want to take advantage of that we're sitting here talking? Yeah, no, just being here in Peru has just reminded me again, whoever's listening, if you have a heart for Latin America, if God has said anything to you about the Spanish speaking people, I just really feel compelled to, um, you know, confirm that with a yes from God. Um, and this is just me, obviously, biased as a Latino. Um, but I, I... I agree with you, and I'm not Latino. Thank you. There you, you know, go. Living I, here seven years. So yeah, yeah, good. I really feel God is on the move. I mean, the stuff I've been seeing in Colombia, um, in Honduras, um, in Mexico. I'm going to be in Mexico in three weeks doing an, one of our leaders' school in Yucatan Peninsula. Um, God is really moving in Latin America. And, you know, without getting political or whatever, there's no doubt a lot, a lot of Latinos in America. Um, I think... It, 
Samuel Rodriguez. He's one of these great pastors, great leaders, um, Hispanic leaders. And we've been talking about God's revival through Latin America. And everybody talks about revival and, you know, through everybody. But if you have a heart for Latin America, I just want to say, um, encourage you to come and join us for what God is doing here. And, you know, the, the Latin people, there's something about Latinos between their, their love for music, their love for people. Their um, love for loud music. And the, their love for loud music, like heaven. <laughs> um, I don't mind loud music. It's just at like three in the morning or something. I, like last night. Did you hear that? I, yes. Yeah. You probably heard it more than I did. I did. So, Oh, yeah. It kept me up. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah. For those of you that have a heart for Latin America, you're welcome. Bienvenido. Um, great. Get good on your Spanish. God's doing amazing things. And I'm looking forward to the day. And I keep prophesying this whenever I come to a Latin country to preach. They invite me to teach, do big conferences, small conferences. I keep saying and prophesying, I can't wait to come back, to come to your events, to learn from you and hear from you. And the Latin people, um, some of these people that have been so broken for such a long time, God is going to raise them as mighty leaders that are just going to take over the nation. So, yeah, I'm saying yes to what God is doing here in Peru and all over Latin America. Great. Well, I feel that that's a, that's a good place to end. Thank you. I normally Thank you, I normally chat with people for however long they they let me. Yeah. But but, but I know the next thing you have to get to. Yeah. So thanks, man. I'm I appreciate glad you that. could come here. Yeah, Steve, it's awesome. First time I've had someone in my office here in this new place I'm living to, to do you. a recording. Cool. So uh, glad to be the first pioneering baby. Doing what? Yeah, pioneering. pioneering. <laughs> right. All right. God bless everybody. Yeah. God bless you all. Love you all. Take care. We hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, you can find us in iTunes or on Stitcher Radio or directly at fireonyourhead.com for more options. If you want to support Steve and Lily Brimner as missionaries in Peru or find out more about what they do, be sure to head over to their blog at stevebrimner.com or check out Steve's Kindle books on Amazon and leave reviews of the ones you liked. See you next time.